Yo, welcome back to another episode of the Bug Junkie Podcast. We got a full crew back today. Jamie, back off vacation. Yeah, I'm, I'm Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse done. You got, you got to see the rats? Yeah, I did see them. <laughs> I've seen a lot at Disney World. Really? How was it? I've never, I've never been. It bad. It was busy. I mean, you got to, I just can't stand a timeline schedule of what you're going to do every day. Yeah. You pretty much got to, you got to be on a schedule at Disney. I imagine it's crowded, a lot of people. A lot of screaming kids. A lot of people, I don't know what they were. <laughs> oh, really? Unidentified? Yeah. You see some people, they're not they're not sure what they uh, identify as. You don't know? Man. You just call was, them y'all. It was, strange, it was some strange <laughs> characters down there. That's no, the we had a good time. One. Glad to be back. Heck yeah. Mark, uh, we had a special guest last week, didn't yeah. we, your buddy? Jody. Jody. Talked about alligator hunting. You missed First that time one, Jody. podcaster. He done pretty good. And he, uh informed us a lot i think uh i learned a lot for sure i definitely makes me want to go now i think it makes you want to go less yeah <laughs> I, I don't know about gator hunting man there's a lot of stuff i'd rather hunt besides the gator you don't want something that's gonna hunt yeah. you back it ain't really <laughs> hunting it's really gator fishing i don't know yeah. why they call it hunting yeah. if you got to use a rod and reel and a hook that's fishing we don't call it you know you go gar fishing you don't go gar I, hunting i think it's cool to feel the feel of you manhandling an alligator but as far as eating one i'm not I ain't. Ha- I've had alligator several times. Yeah. Never, I mean, they blow me much away better yet. things. To no, eat. I'll get. A, I'll get a steak. I'll take a steak over alligator I'll take a any frog day. Over alligator any day. Fro- uh, frog leg. Heck yeah, that is a no brainer there. Yeah. But what's my, the money you spend to do that, and the meat that you get is just not. I don't know. I guess it's not quality enough. So pretty much all you bring home is tail meat, ain't it? Pretty much. Uh, he said uh, you can get some other stuff off of it, but you got to pretty much have a process to do it. So what he was saying to like get all that fat off of it because. They tried to do it with something. But it was a tail. And they screwed it up, and he, he said it was inedible. Yeah. I don't know. We, we cooked one. I had the Craig Verhaga come, the ninja, and he that's his specialty, and he cleaned the tail. I mean, it was it took some time. It wasn't just super hard. You just got to know that really in that tail, if you think of it like a cross that runs down through it, and there's a piece almost like backstrap meat that runs on each section of that cross, and it's, cir- it's circulated in fat, I mean, all yeah. through it. So you got to break out each part of that, trim all that fat out. If you don't, it's going to taste fishy. As long as you take the time to do that, the, the meat's okay. But it's just not enough to, to, for me, I mean, I guess you'd have to kill a big one. So, but, you know, how that goes. So anything big like that's probably not as good anyway. No, probably ain't. I, mean, I can say doing it if we had them here, you know, doing it and, you know, kind of maintaining them, like what they're doing, trying to maintain yeah. the population and all that stuff like that. Because, you know, gators are about like any other you know, hogs or something like that. They do produce a lot of young and they're top of the food chain. So they, yeah. Go. So they get overcrowded. They start getting into rural areas and stuff like that, or, yeah. you know, populated areas and they're trying to keep them knocked back. But, uh, I would do it if it was up here, but just to travel off and spend yeah. a lot of money to do that. I don't go know. Hang a gator. It is, it, yeah. It'd be hard to do. Yeah. I started my hunting season early this week. What'd you do? Man, I've been hunting a field rat. You see my video I sent you? I saw it around your air conditioner unit. Yes. So I got this field rat has been in my AC all summer long. Like, he ain't messing nothing up, but the wife seen him the other day, so we got to get the field rat gone. And, I mean, it's borderline possum. Like, he's pretty good size, <laughs> old boy. He's healthy. He's healthy. So I bought some rat traps, set my blink camera up out there, and just set it down on the ground where I can see him. And it goes off about once or twice an hour. He's pretty freaking smart. He reached up there yesterday. I got peanut butter on one of them. He got up underneath the air conditioner, reached out and grabbed the trap, and slid it all the way over to where it wouldn't get him, and got the freaking peanut butter off the trap. And I got him on camera doing it. <laughs> but I popped him one time yesterday. He still he he got away. But what'd you hit him with? A pellet gun? Oh no, one of the traps finally got oh, him. Oh, oh, oh. But he I think he kind of just bench pressed it right off of him and kept on going. Like he's about to get solid. one of them arm traps yeah. on the cone. Yeah, something. I ordered a uh, I got a sticky trap coming, and then I, I hate, ordered a uh, that's so nasty. Sticky trap's so nasty. I don't care, I gotta get him going. I got that, and I got a live trap, a mouse live trap. It's, it's supposed to be like eight inches long, like a little bit. Oh, that ain't going to hold it. He's going to tote that. Oh, he might. He's a <laughs> horse now. He's a, he's a Boone and Crockett. If you're going to have a rat, that's him. He's good. I've got some in a little small live trap cage I'll bring over tomorrow. You just put the bait in the back of it, and it's full like chipmunks and squirrels. It'll He'll go in and get it? it? Yeah, it ought to catch him. Oh, he's slick. He ain't no dummy. I he bet pretty- you he get it. How tight's the wire on it, though? Because I mean, them things can get the crack like on half- that air conditioner unit ain't big. It's probably I two inches. It's a field rat uh, now. He ought, to, he ought to be a pretty good size. He's he pretty good size. He is. I'm telling you, people don't realize. You get out there and you start bush hogging. Oh, yeah. 
You don't realize how many creatures are out I'm talking about, it's not, I ain't talking about a couple. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of rats and field mice. That you never know. Yeah. I hadn't seen the footage yet, but when we burned that field, Jacob was out there filming and the rats were running everywhere, you know, from, cause we had fire coming out from both sides. And it was, I mean, I was amazed by how many ran out of there. I mean, I bush all at the house. That's, it's the same. I mean, it's the same way out there. I mean, that might have been what, three acres up there, top of that hill. And I, I don't know how many rats it's per, per acres on it. Acres. But there's at least a hundred per acre, at least. But I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, I mean, the only thing to hunt them, I guess, be like a coyote or fox. Really ain't nothing else. Hawks, I guess. Hawk I mean, watch, right every time we fire a bush hog up, them hawks, they're coming. Sorry, oh, yeah. They needed last week when I was bush hog, or week four last when I bush hogged all them food plots down to start putting our uh, turnips in. There was freaking mice everywhere. And here comes them hawks. They knew we were. I was a bush hog, and they must have heard me or seen yeah, me one. Morning. And here they come. One of them got your dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, drew a little blood. She's yeah, a little hesitant. Yeah. I, I don't know who whooped so, who on that what, one. What is that dog? A weenie asset? What it's called? <laughs> a weagle. A weagle. Wait, is that what you call weagle. it? A weagle. Big weenie. Speaking of food plots, Mikey, what, what you did? Uh, it's time to start thinking about what we're gonna do fall. Yeah, it's time to start thinking about what we're gonna do for fall. Um, we. We're kind of we we we've got a plan that kind of the same thing we've done last year. We're breaking up where we're going to put our brassicas or our you know we plant purple top turnips and we may put a few radishes in there with it, but mostly purple top turnips. And we usually do a couple acres of that you know on the property, and then you know we'll we'll let that get up, and then we'll deplete the summer fields, uh, the rest of them is there, and then we'll go in and plant our grains, which is usually wheat. Uh, oats and we put a little bit of crimson clover in there with it just to have something during the spring for the turkeys it's that time for sure yeah. like the vetch though that stuff it held up in a winter a whole lot longer last year than what i thought it, made it, it would. Past Thanksgiving. Yeah. it's gonna stay i, I mean what, probably two one or two frosts last year probably yeah, and, it, and it probably would this year because it's so thick it wouldn't make it all the way to christmas but it make it on into november easy yeah that, it, it's, it's so, so thick, thick now and it, a lot of it be protected up under that younger stuff i did notice those those uh turnip plots you bush hog down where it had that buckwheat and vetch buckwheat on it came back didn't it's it? done it's done re-sowed yeah. yeah i guess the seeds when we got a little bit of rain pop right back up and that would be a good i mean that would be that would be a cool thing to do if you you know went through and bush hog and let the buckwheat come back up and go again but you know frost gonna catch it too so yeah. it ain't gonna last long so you wouldn't have you wouldn't have anything for winter uh -huh. if you do that the whole goal is so we can have some food for that late season, December, January, because most of it would make it till opening rifle. We usually don't get that hard a winter too early. But no, I mean I, we we try age it to where the deer all constantly got something on the property to to eat, and we leave that summer stuff out there in certain places for them to still have something to munch on during you know this time when we're starting to prep these other plots, and once these plots come up and the grains come up and all that, we. They kind of they kind of do the same thing. We'll have those those greens out there, and they'll kind of play out, and turn into bulbs late in the year, and you know later on in January, February, when everything else is kind of playing out, we've got those bulbs out there for them to eat, and they start eating them. They did, absolutely did last year. I was impressed by how many turnips. They don't eat the whole thing. No, they they pull them up out of the ground and, and then you know, bite them several times, but they'll be. I mean, it's. It gets rough, don't it, Mark? It's a little strong. You don't want to be downwind of it, a turnip field, but but there's a lot of food out there for them to eat. Yeah, it's worked out. I mean, so far, I mean, we've kept deer on the property for, you know, year round. Now. So what do you think about having to move your turnip fields from year to year instead of replanting them in the same spot? Because I always heard that you're not supposed to consecutively plant turnips in the same ground. It's probably about like any other any other thing. I mean, you know, most cash crop farmers, you know, they'll plant, you know, corn one year and then they'll plant bean, beans for two or three years. And then they may come back, put cotton for a year, and then they'll go back to beans and then back to corn. And, you know, they it, it's good to move your stuff around the way it is because certain, certain plants deplete certain minerals out of the ground mm -hmm. where other ones don't. So as you deplete those minerals, you know, you don't want to keep putting that same plant back in that same spot and not replacing that or – Giving it time to recover, you know, you still got to fertilize lime, do all that, but you still want to make sure you got that those nutrients in the ground. So if you keep putting it in the same spot, your plants will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you'll eventually just you'll be undepleted whatever nutrient is taken out of the yeah. ground. Now you got a problem. 
I do like the fact that the clover's coming back around on some of our fields. Man, it some of it was really good. good. Yeah, I, I guess that drought got it some, but I noticed that the other day when I was riding around some of those back trails and stuff where we planted some, mm. hand planted some clover last year. It's popping real good, but some places where it was good, like it's just gone. Yeah. Like it didn't make it. I don't know what was up with that. If the ground was bad or didn't have the right nurse crop on it or what, but. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, lot some of that clover don't last for a couple of years anyway, yeah. so it, it may have ran its course and just needs to be reseeded. But uh, some of the other places we have, like y'all were saying, it's, it's coming back. It's time to fertilize it, too. You need to catch a rain about now, you know, sometime between now and the next couple of weeks and throw some low nitrogen fertilizer on your clover plots, and they'll go ahead and flourish you that's, know, by that's October, November. Kind of what we're waiting on on these fall plots, too. Like, you want to make sure. I mean, you don't just want to, oh, it's, you know, Labor, hey, let's put some seed in the ground yeah. for fall. It's pretty gotta, dry right now. Yeah, you got to watch those. You got to watch those rains. You know, when when your fronts are coming through and get some rain on them, because you put that seed in the ground. Yeah, it may lay out there and it may germinate, but then again, it may stay dry till end of October. Yeah. So we kind of that's kind of our plan. When we did it last year and it worked pretty well, everything popped right. Yeah, we we you know we lost plots both ways. You know, we we planted it during the drought and it didn't. You know, it came up, but there was no moisture there. We planted them early, and you know, and then it was still hot, and it, especially the grains like the wheat and stuff like that, it would come up off of the dew, just using that as you know moisture to sprout, and then we we'd have a hot week or a couple of hot weeks, and it just die. Then yep. you got to redo it. Everything fails. Just throw the ryegrass out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's green. the surefire. It'll get Man, green on it. I wish people would stay. It's, it looks good. <laughs> it's pretty and green, but that's about as far as it goes. Yeah. I'm all for the wheat now. I'm sold on that. After last year watching them deer, like you want something that comes up, looks good, and they mow it down, mow it down. It's and really it takes it, cheap. Takes yeah. tax the brows. Yeah. I was I was very impressed with wheat last year. I never really thought much of it until last year. And see, I thought we were gonna have a wheat shortage because you know out in the Midwest and stuff, you know they had a bad drought, you know from spring all the way through to summer, and there was a lot of articles about that about wheat crops being real skinny, and a lot of the farmers just depleted their fields, didn't even harvest them. Because they weren't going to get the yield off of them that was, you know, worth going out there yeah. and doing. So they claimed insurance, just burned the fields off, just got rid of them. So I'm worried we may have a wheat shortage. I hadn't I hadn't read any more articles about it, but I know we got an oat shortage because I just stopped by the seed company this morning and they had half a pile of oats and said they wouldn't be probably getting no more this year. Wow. Did you buy them? Yeah, I bought them. <laughs> Is that going to be enough? We're going to do some more. Mm-mm. Well, I'm, I bought as many as the pickup hole. Yeah. <laughs> it was sagging pretty good coming down the What highway. was the price of oats this year? And we, did you price uh, everything here around here local? Yeah, I got Nine bucks. in my pocket. Oh, yeah, you got the paperwork. Yeah, I got the paperwork in my pocket. Let me get my wallet. Usually about nine bucks a bag, aren't they? Uh, like that. So you got two different kinds of wheat. You got non-germinating wheat and planting wheat. And then you got bob oats and you got black oats, which yeah. is most common around here. Um, So wheat, planting wheat was $14 a bag. It's went up so the, the other, you know, like stuff you would been run, yeah, been run whatever. or feed grade or whatever. Yeah, that stuff's like nine, nine. ten dollars yeah. a bag. Um, and then the oats, 21 a bag. Ooh, oats is high this year. Yeah, I think they were, uh, they were, I forget what they were last year, probably 18 dollars or something like that. It depends on which one you get. Bob oats, black oats, two different prices to you. That's, that's considered winter oat, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so how much difference you think? On South Trump with the eco edge growing a wall and now turn up, oh. how much difference is that going to make? The edge is going to make the biggest difference of what food you got out there. That's the one thing I think we did right this year. Right, that's the best looking place down here. Oh, oh yeah. It looks like a sanctuary. And uh, well, the plantation field over the other side does the same thing. Like when you, I had been up in the stand to look, but it just created all these little feeding pockets. Like little shoots they can travel through. Yeah. And it's, it's like a highway for them. So. As long as it now, that stuff grew way taller than we thought it would this year. Yeah. There's yeah, some of it 12, 14 foot high. Yeah, some of it was real tall. The frost to knock it. Yeah, and frost, it that's, the, well, see, that's the goal on it. You want the frost to knock it back to where you can still see through it, see a deer moving through it, but they still feel like yeah. they're covered up because most of them aren't. Hey, they're probably not even eight foot wide, you know, or if that, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, I got them about two. Two passes, two maybe? Two passes so. wide around the edges of the field and over by the – plantation like against the stand it's about four or five yeah deep right against the road right there it gives it a lot of good cover to get to the stands too that's been the big thing but well what i kind of want to talk about today was game camera placement we've already had ours out yeah just kind of watching those plots and seeing what would go and we've noticed 
deer, like when we put up one that's on the eco edge where we know deer have crossed in the past when it was wide open, that's where we're seeing a ton of deer. They're using it already. Yeah, they may not, they're not really necessarily like walking dead in the middle of it. They're just like on the side of it yep. as they move move around the field. So they stay right up against it. I think they're they just travel. In, I yeah. think they travel transitions, like you said, to blend in. Yeah. You notice like, a lot of times you see them big does. You won't even see the fawn unless you zoom in and look, and the fawn will stay like right there. In tucked it. Like in. You'll just see their ears yeah. or something, you know. Well, we've seen turkeys using that stuff this year mm-hmm. since we've had the cameras out on it. We've seen, I mean, Neighbor's cow. She's yeah, that cow <laughs> using on anybody. I ran one out of it this morning. But a uh, neighbor's cow he ran yeah. it out or run it over. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, I ran it over. Out and I sent him a text again this yeah. morning. And yeah. anyways, oh, I found he, they've been walking this way closer. I've been seeing signs. Yeah, there's cow crap all yeah. over the top of the, the hill now, and everywhere yeah. else. Yeah. They're roaming now. Guns, Wait to see what you fit to start planting to pop up. Yeah what it is but but talking about game cameras we've been running i guess four different kinds this year mm. and i wanted to like I, I don't know if i have one that's the best that i could that i could recommend because i mean the, and the ones we're running are cellular game cams it's not uh, just a regular game cam but it's ones where we can get alerts into our phones but um we're running the tactic cams yeah the wild game innovations a browning and the coverts I always thought coverts were the best. Back when I started using cellular cameras, covert were top of the line, but they don't they don't respond near as well as I've seen these Tacticams and even the Wild Game Innovations. Tacticams have been, yeah. been solid. Yeah. Tacticams probably if I had to pick one to go with that I'd recommend it'd be the Tactics. Yeah. Just because it's just, I think we got the Reveal Xs. I don't know what version X is. I don't think it's that's the high-end one. No, it's, it's, not. Not. it's not. These are hundred. Yeah, these are $130 cameras. And the only thing, I mean, the only thing bad about them is you do got to pay for the picks. I mean, it's like 12 bucks a month for unlimited. They have different, all of them have different plans. Um, I, the Wild Game and the Browning have like 100 free. Yeah. So you get 100 free picks and you don't have to sign, you don't have to pay anything. So if you just got an area that you know you're just trying to watch travel, you're not putting it on anything like a food source or anything like that. They're not, you know, you'd probably be fine. But that's what I was going to say. If you if you're going if you're going to go on that budget where you you know not paying for the subscription or whatever, and you need a hundred pictures, you better make sure it's not on corn or whatever you're putting out there for or a food plot or something like that. A travel corridors and don't put it on a duck blind because the geese will burn it up one yeah. time. Man, oh yeah, we we had those wild games on the duck blinds last year. Last year, these geese came in. It was thousands of run out of pictures. By you, the yeah, you feel morning. you run the card out, and we had big cards in them just because I mean, they, but when you looked at it, there was just thousand geese in front yeah. of it. You know, that was constant movement long. all night long. So it's taking a picture every minute. I mean, 12 bucks a month is, I mean, money's money. Don't get me wrong, but if you're factoring in, getting in your truck, loading a side by side up, driving to where you're hunting at, then disturbing everything you're hunting yeah. at, 12 bucks a month is. That's the way to go. But is that 12, I think so. so is that twelve bucks a month cover every camera you no, use per camera. camera? Per camera. Yeah. So if you like to run twenty cameras, you're gonna be yeah. spending some money. But I mean that so there's a couple of different ones that do have like a, a link system. I forget which brand it is. It may be Covert that has one where you can run like six or seven cameras off one and it they all kind of daisy chained each other some kind of way. I hadn't yeah. I hadn't messed with those too much, but the my problem with those was when I bought the coverts, those, those cameras were nearly 400 bucks. Mm. And I mean, it was early, you know, it was early stage cell cams. Five years ago, probably. Yeah, yeah. It was probably six years ago. Whenever, whenever I first, no, we had them over at that other place we had over yeah. in Soda County. So those cameras were pretty old and they lasted all right, but for the price and the plan price is about the same anyway. So I would still say the $140 camera is doing just as good a job. Now, when you put out these cellular cameras, all of I think all of them work. Yeah. But the big thing is signal, and that's what most people don't realize. When you're you're on your hunting land, most of the time cell phones don't work because you're out. You know, yeah. we're 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 not too far from town here. What twenty miles probably? But the cell service it's out here limited in areas. For very sure. very limited. I don't, and most of them only have like Verizon or AT and T. So we, you know, and I've got some SIM cards with both. Well, neither one of those do well out here. So you're in dead zone spot. So you have to really, before you put out a cell cam and you're going to trust it to send you pics, you got to have good cell signal there on your phone first. 
So make sure, like, if you're going out and you got a spot, because you don't think about the canopy, the trees over you, all the cover, all that's blocking service. And so unless you just got really good cell service, they're probably not going to work. Them picks will download to your card. You just have to go in and get your card. They will. They work as a regular game cam, too. The camera so, it still works. It yeah, just it's it not, not transmitting yeah. to you. Yeah. And so a lot of times I've hooked them up, got them tested, running at the house. Like, oh, man, you know, this one's sending pics. It's great. And you take them out in the field, and they don't do anything, and you think it's the camera. Well, it's it's just the service. Sales service, sales service. So some of them make booster antennas and things like that. I tried some of those with those spy points. It didn't have any luck. Um, I'm not real crazy about that brand. That's the one that yeah. we made. they made it one season. And then you couldn't get them to do anything after that. So they're almost like throwaways. Those other cameras we got, though, we've had those for a couple Several of years. years. Yeah. I got the Tacticams when they first started coming along to try them. Wild Game Innovations, I think Mark found it last year for the duck blind. And we ended up buying some more of them because they were so easy to operate. And they did. Operate. I ain't going to say the photo quality is as good as some of them. I mean, they're pretty good. They're really, they're, to me, they're better at night. The photo yeah. quality and the night photos are way better than the daytime photos. That's right. But. I mean, for the bang for the buck. And, I mean, we put them through the ringer. I mean, you got to think, these cameras have been out nine months out of the year. A and long we time. We pull them in, kind of clean them up, put batteries in them, refresh them, give them a break, we put them right back out. Yeah, two of them were on a duck blind in water. So, yeah. I'm not sure they didn't go underwater one time. <laughs> they still work for a while. Now, I do have, like, one of those will not work. It's probably one that got underwater. Yeah. But uh, the other two kind of salvaged from last year. But we tried the Browning cellular this year for the first time, and it's okay. Yeah, it's um, we had, I want to wait till the leaves get off the trees and see if signal gets better on it. Pictures are halfway decent. Um, you know, it's pretty simple to operate too. And they're all about the same price point. So I think the technology is about the same in all of them. I don't know if one's better than the other. It's just if you want one that's got a free plan for 100 picks or you want to pay for your picks as you go, that's the big thing with them. But well, what do y'all think about placement? Like, so if you're going to run game cameras, how do you move them around? How do you know where to set them up? Jamie, you kind of had an idea. You was telling us about what was uh Yeah, uh, I need to do some more research on it. Mark looked at it. And actually, I, I followed guys on Seek One, and they use this a lot. Uh, Spartan, Spartan Forge. Spartan Forge. And they say it is this guy, the best thing to understand is ex-military. So he's got a lot of background training that developed this program. And it does like predicting deer movement. It's, hey, supposedly he's more accurate than like people go by the moon phase and all that kind of stuff, but. He does it off actual live deer. Yeah, he's got, he works with a couple of universities that have collars on deer, and they monitor how the deer move at what weather condition. But I don't quite. I'll have to do some more research, kind of like Jamie was saying. But it has a setting or app on the app that basically kind of does a topo of your property. And I don't know if it like logs data as you enter it or if it's straight out the gate, but it gives you suggestions of where to place cameras. Yeah, it'll, it'll do like. like- Deer prediction, you can map out your stuff, where where to put cameras at. Uh, I mean, everything I've read and heard about these guys, this stuff is like pretty much spot on. Have you downloaded that? <laughs> no, I have not yet. I got I the app to, downloaded. I paid too. The, it's, I don't, I don't think I upgraded. I don't think mine's the first Yeah, yeah I, I know it upgrade one on it, but it's, it's pretty neat. It's, it's way over my head. I, I'd like to sit down and spend some time with it, especially this year and kind of, kind of document what we do, what we see and what we do and stuff yeah. like that. But, I think a lot of it too goes back is knowing your property, not necessarily relying on technology, but knowing your property, you're not going to get it right the first year you're down there. You can no. put out cameras and you might not see nothing, move them. I mean, it's just like fishing. If you ain't catching fish, go somewhere else, you know, and kind of get an idea. Um, one of the things I've always liked doing is walking the property line. I don't know what it is about a property line, but if you walk a ditch bank or a fence line, you can easily see where these deer are crossing or when they're coming on your property and go from there, you know, and, just take your time, move them. It's no big deal. Yes, because I mean, most of the time, you know, we we kind of put ours around food sources and things like that. We put them in travel corridors a lot of times if we're, you know, if we if we think they're moving through that area because you know they we've talked about that a bunch too. Is you know how they their patterns change through them, you know, certain times of the year. But like right now, you know, we've we've got cameras on some of the food plots and some travel corridors, but now we've got persimmons muscadines persimmon trees you know and they're bumper crop this year yeah yeah all of them all the persimmon trees are limbs are sagging with i pulled those seed last weekend and cut it what is spoon. Spoon. every seed i cut was a spoon oh uh, well that means good. we're gonna be shoveling boys that'll be good 
But yeah, you you put those on you put those on persimmon trees. You you don't think a lot of deer come to persimmon tree. Now you're gonna get possums and coons and all that, but man, those deer love persimmons. I mean that's kinda like there's little Debbie in the woods. That's it. That's that's the Christmas tree cake. And musket dimes is even worse. Like if you can get them on a musket dime vine that you can find that's really good. I mean, it may not even be a deer trail around it and that vine starts dropping. Yeah, they're gonna be and there. They, so, for however long they drop for a week or two, you know, they'll be right there. Well, we found we found muscadines last year on the other property and we set a camera up on it first time ever. From the first day we put them out that night, they were on that thing for about two or three weeks. Yeah. Till all the muscadine grapes were gone. I think like Mike said, food source is key. And say you don't say this is your first year, you just got the property this month, you want to put cameras out. Man, think of it just like you are. Deer are gonna travel the easiest path on that yeah. property. Mm-hmm. So just like on the other property, we've got that huge ditch. Guess where they're going to cross that? Where the forge is, where we ride the side by side to cross. Mm-hmm. So put a camera there. That's and we see them cross it every day. I'm amazed by how that's just a highway for animals. Yeah. I mean, we there's, got- a, there's a bunch of other places they can come out of that ditch because we see them do it. But that way right there, you go like every hour, every hour, it. every hour, something is yeah. coming across that. Ditch. It is, a, you know, a lot of people think we're just a four wheeler trail that we're yeah. talking about. This is all right. This is about a forty foot wide gap in the ditch with a gravel road through the middle of it. Yeah, and so it's pretty deer, much a field road. Yeah, it's a field road. It goes down in the ditch and comes back. I mean, you drive big a big ditch. tracker with a disc and all that through there. Yeah, and them deer come through there all the time. All Turkey. days. But Every time. Cobra, we well, ain't got no more pictures of that old neck and dog. Yeah, he was on the other day. It's hard to tell. It was a mangy. It's a mangy old coyote, I think. It's a chip cobra. <laughs> but, well, we noticed that, that the deer, like you said, are moving just in the easiest way they yeah. can. They don't always take the hard way to do the thickest stuff. Now, they will if they got to break out. But. Yeah. But you don't say, you know, that was – Talking about that ditch, you know, we've got a lot of kudzu on our ditch right now. You know, that stuff's neck deep out there right now. It's thriving right now. And you don't see a lot of deer trails in and out of that kudzu going down. And Now, they do have a few places they have to cross it in the kudzu, but on that one ditch where we have that road at, there's not a lot of trails that come out of that kudzu. They use that road to go. And you see them on the camera where they walk up and down the ditch. Yeah. Like they're walking down that gravel ditch, staying out of that kudzu, moving up down that ditch because it's just easy to move through there. Well, I imagine it's cooler down there. There's plenty of cover. Yeah. Uh, they can get out of it at any point if they, yeah. something gets after them. But it's, I mean, there's a whole another highway along. You think it's a ditch. Oh, there's just water in it. Deer ain't going to go down it. No, there's a gravel bar mm. on both sides of the little channel that they can just hit cruise. And see, what I like about cameras right now is all the bucks are all together. Yeah. If you see one buck, there's another one on the camera somewhere. Just look, you know, and heck, we've got pictures of three and four bucks together, you know, and. That that gets your blood pumping, especially when it's it's something to get you excited about. I guess but. I was I, I was shocked to see this that uh, we've already got some that have shed all their velvet. Yeah, and it seems real early because we got what that season's coming up this weekend. The velvet velvet mm-hmm. hunt people are doing that. What do y'all but, think about that? I think it all I mean, goes could, back to protein and nutrients. I couldn't <laughs> do mosquitoes. <laughs> uh, I, I ain't going. I don't want to kill one that bad. Oh, it's too damn hot. I yeah. ain't in it right now. I mean, I, I got to get that. Get in that mood to deer hunt. Yeah. I'm not in I mean, right now, I'm not in it. It's, it's hot. Well, my thing is, out. it's just like, I got a crossbow to house. I got a great crossbow. I can shoot it well. Like, I I have nothing against it, but they ain't the same when I just come down here and bow hunt by myself without yeah. all y'all or like everybody down here. Like, yeah. I want us all to have opportunities. So, like, I mean, both seasons fun, but I don't like mosquitoes and it ain't the same without your buddies. I mean, it just ain't. Well, do you consider that a trophy? If you kill a velvet buck, would you get it mounted or is that something y'all I mean, would yeah. think would be a. I mean, yeah. I would, yeah. Well, well, we got one on camera. I'd get mounted for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. See, me, it's like if I saw one still in velvet during rifle season, you know, late, late in the year, they should be shed. I'd probably have to kill that. Yeah. Cause that would be cool. But just to go out there and kill one now, like we yeah. know where they're at now. Yeah. It ain't like if you, them. if you've been scouting your land, you got cameras out, you know where they're feeding right now. It would be no problem to go kill a buck this weekend. I yeah. guarantee it. If you I know you got completely bucks. Completely wrong. But if we said, let's get Ricky this week, we could get him. Oh, I guarantee it. I don't, I don't think there's no doubt no. that you could, that all four of us could go kill a buck here this weekend. If we wanted to. Now I ain't saying they're all 150, ain't they ain't 150 man. inch deer or yeah. nothing. But it's just a velvet buck, which I and I don't have any urge to do it. I mean, it's just I'd rather let them. I'd rather let them drop that velvet. And let's see what their horns are going to look like. Just get a good gauge on them, and then see if we want to let them walk. Yeah, where they're going to grow next. Well, that's year. another but, thing, right? Like 
we've done this before. Like we look at deer on camera and we think, man, that's a you know, pretty good deer in velvet. It's hard to judge them in velvet. It's very hard. And then, A, it's hard to judge them on camera. Yeah. That's what me and Darren were talking about yesterday. About That'll fool you. You see, a, man, it looks like he's showing enough good deer on camera. Then, then you see him in person. He's like, oh, I mean, it's, it's good, but it's not what I thought. Or yeah. it works the opposite. Vice versa. It ain't big, you know, it's bigger than what I thought. Like, I look back. Like, I never see that. <laughs> <laughs> like, the year I killed Sling Blade, like, we had him... We had him every month that whole year. We knew what he was from the get-go. But, you know, we had pictures of Sling Blade all year. And some of the pictures we had, he looked like a stud. He looked bigger than what he really is. And you look at other ones, you're like, well, he wasn't all that. I mean, he was a good deer, and he was – I mean, I'm tickled to death with him, but cameras will fool you. What is sure. it, just the angles of the lenses and all I that? Think so. You I don't think know, that you don't have anything to judge the depth perception you, by? In your mind, you're wanting – you know what I'm saying? You're wanting to be big. Yeah, you want to see a big deer on camera and then – Kind of, yeah. I don't know, you remember that? Oh, look at the camera. I saw a six foot coon the other yeah. day. <laughs> Jerk was standing up. I was like, he's as big as a grown man. You it just, the, it'll fool you the, the trajectory of it, the lens, I guess. The first year we put cameras down here. And it was, matter of fact, it was out there where the shop is now. Well, we killed the doe under the yeah. cemetery. And we had that one picture that had like this silhouette of this buck in the background. It. I still yeah. got it on my phone. Yeah. You, you and can we, see it coming out. Yeah. We swarmed down. That was a, that was a 200 inch deer, you know. <laughs> But we, I don't know that it was a deer or not. Like it was one of them things like you squint your eyes, you know, that's an eight point. Then you look at it, it's like, oh, that's a vine, you know. That's what you need to do. Pretty sure a neighbor killed that deer. You need to design a camera that does it, like enlarges. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You can make a a 115 look like a 140. Yeah. (laughs) Cameras definitely have their advantages. They have, they do have some disadvantages. Um, I mean, A, I think if you're not careful, it's easy to get in the habit to hunt a cabin, not hunt a stand. Yeah. I did that one year up there at Stanley's. It was a, it was a stud I had on camera. This is back when cards, you know, the old camera. And I hunted it. I seen him one time hunting and I never, and I wasted the whole year hunting him. Just you're to, only getting a glimpse of that deer's yeah, day. So yeah. who knows where he's at the rest of the 24 hours he's standing, you know? Well, to me, it's not, they're not as important during hunting season as they are right now. Like coming out of the when all the you know fields are starting to change, we're changing out food plots. They're in velvet fixing the shed. That's when I would say you want to take your inventory of your deer, see what the movement does. You get to see the new fawns. You get to see how healthy the does are. You can get a gauge on you know how many how many deer, bucks, and doe are on your property by the number of cameras you put out and where you put them out. So there's a lot of valuable information going into hunting season that that those game cameras will give you, other than just waking up and saying oh. I'm going to get up and go hunt this but stand this still, morning. That this, still crosses your I mind. I mean, it, it has to, but I think at, at some point it's like we'll have those – we'll move those cameras two or three times for hunting season now. Yeah. We need to move them this weekend. We need to get them on some of these muscadines and, and uh, persimmons while they're ready to drop because that won't last but a couple more weeks. So that's probably why some states, you know, they're outlawing cameras because you can it, you can pattern your deer and pretty much like is yeah. it – I'm not saying it's a guaranteed kill, but some – State law will see it as you're getting a guaranteed. I can see. I can see it is an advantage. I think it's definitely an advantage. Well, but to me, the advantage is I'm not stinking up my property. If I got that game camera out there and don't have to go check cards, don't have to travel on it and scout and do all that stuff, and I can just watch movement, those deer aren't spooked. I mean, in my mind, cameras are better than a pile of corn out there. You're shooting a deer over eating corn. Oh, yeah. And my, I mean, I might be totally wrong. That's just my opinion. But I mean, the light, you I don't know, know if they're that better. Is, that corn's almost guaranteed. You know, I, mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know. If <laughs> but no, but no, as far as the, sport, the sporting side of it, more information. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, I yeah. mean, you got, you got a food source, a water source. You know, they're coming to it. You don't necessarily know they're walking in front of that camera. And yes, you see it in the camera. You know yeah. that deer is in that area. But I don't know. I, I, but the flip right. side of that is people, and we're guilty of it, people think when that, takes a picture that you're seeing the full picture you're seeing one piece of a thousand piece oh, yeah. puzzle i yeah, mean you, know what's beside or you don't have it or whatever and just like we found out this year we pulled cards on one and it had another thousand pictures that we mm. didn't even get that don't try because it only transmits one of the group if you haven't set you know the biggest thing that i saw and i thought was super cool it'll eat a card up is the video feature that tells you a lot because you can there is so much from from video that you do not see with just one steal. Cause I mean, even though they were what five second clips, yeah, we had, we, we'd set one of our cameras and forgot we'd done it and they don't transmit the video to your phone. So all you get is like one little preview clip. But when you go back and pull your card and load it up, 
there will be, you'll see the movement of the deer. You'll see more deers coming in and out of frame. You'll see deers in the background pass by that you never see in just a still pick. Yeah. And that was one thing that I thought was, as soon as we get like on some really good food sources and we don't have them on good food sources now, but when these persimmons and stuff start dropping or we get scrape action, we're going to switch to video and get some of those videos see, of deer well, see, working scrapes video, and eating stuff. The video feature, you know, that does kind of help you judge that deer a lot better because, you know, you know, a still picture, it snaps a picture of him. Usually his face is right in the freaking camera or he twists his head real fast and it blurs him out and he looks like a monster, you know? Yeah. Um, but on that video feature, if it's on long enough where he's, you know, he's moving his head around, you can see his spread. You can see how long he's kind of judge how long his tines are. You know, if he's skinny, is he got mad? You know, yeah. yeah, you, you, you kind of really get a chance to see like the whole deer and, and all sides of him when it's on that video feature. And you, you can judge him a lot better off of that than yeah. you can just a single clip picture that, you know, took a picture of him straight on, you know, or something like that. I do, mean, you, do you think you could ac- accurately score one from or yeah. a good guess from that? What from do you a think? Video, yeah, yeah. You know, I think some people pick. on apps. On, don't, on, yeah, don't they have some kind of apps? That do so that? I downloaded the app because there's one on our camera. I wanted to really know what he was. What, what app is it? There's two different ones I found on Apple. Um, let's see. I downloaded the first one. It said it was free. Then it wanted ten dollars, so I deleted it. <laughs> uh, this one's called Rough Score, and it's got two functions where you can take a picture off your phone and upload it to the app. And it's supposed to give you a rough score of the deer. And I was like, we'll give it a shot, you know? So I took the one that's on our camera and gave it, hit the button and it come back and it was like one thirty, not close. Yeah. Not even close. So I had another picture on my phone that I knew a deer was actually certified score one ninety eight, And I used it and it said it scored one twenty. So yeah, so you don't know how accurate even they close. are, but it does have another feature to where it walks you through scoring one. It gives yeah. you all the measurements, what to take, document it, it calculates it for you, and you can save it to your phone with a picture of that deer. So I mean, it does have some benefit, but digitally scoring one, I ain't sold on it. But I think if you take your time and look at one, and you know, kind of go off what we do, you know, if it's outside the ears, you know, that's sixteen plus, you know, so you got a little bit of measurement there, you know, and then just. Kind of guess. I mean, it's it's still a guessing game until you put a tape on it, you know. Yeah. It's and crazy you, that you watch enough of these TikToks and these videos, you know, guys actually have a legitimately scored deer, but it don't look like that on video. Like yeah. you look at it, it's like, oh, that's a 140. Well, I mean, it's proof right here. It's a 160, 170 inch deer. You know, you it's it's fool you. When you know? I when I read the forums or Facebook groups and all that, that's one of the biggest controversies. Scoring deer, score yeah. agent score this deer. You get answers all over the place, and it's very hard just to to be close to one. And you know, you know my stance on scoring a deer. It, if it's got it, it's freaking it's counts. Good. <laughs> yeah. Like, it ain't no, uh, it ain't no such thing as deductions. deductions. I mean, yeah. me personally. Oh, yeah, I don't take deductions either. No. We all took deductions. Mine ain't never had enough horn to deduct anything. <laughs> We'd be in the negatives. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, it's scoring – I like the aspect of it because it kind of gives you a gauge of what that deer is, but I don't think you just take away from what that animal truly is. No, because, yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, really big eight points that I would have shot before I would have shot, you know, some other 10 points that was on the wall and, you know, in a just saying a sporting goods store or something like that, you know, and that, that eight point probably didn't score about 135. Yeah. You know, and this deer over here scored 150, 160 inches, but I would have killed this one over here. Just because of the bigger, more mature. Wide. Yeah, and he yeah. didn't have as many points. To me, that is a bigger, you know, that was a more trophy to you. Trophy to me than than the deer with a tight rack with a bunch of points on well, it. Well, if you told me you shoot a 130 inch eight point or 140 inch 10 point, I'm like, you, an eight point to me looks better than a 10. Yeah. Like, I'm not all pumped up. Everybody's like, oh, I got a perfect 10. I mean, cool. But to me, an eight looks better. But a 12 looks pretty good, too. One of, the, <laughs> one of the biggest deer I ever killed, I didn't realize it scored that much. You know, and I just, I didn't think much of it. You know, it wasn't as big as some of the other deer I'd killed. And a guy scored it. You know, I was like, there ain't no way that deer scored that much. Well, got him there, mass or Extra just times. the amount of points he had yeah. stickers and stuff on him yeah. and all that stuff i mean he was he was up in right at 150 or 150 just barely over 150 yeah. and i was like there ain't no way just didn't look it Mm-mm. 
It didn't look nothing like it. I mean, he had the mass and it carried all the way out, but he just he wasn't as impressive as some of the other deer I'd killed. That's how I score. It don't look as impressive, yeah. but the numbers are there. Well, you know, and those numbers too. Who cares when it comes down to it? If it's a trophy to you, kill it. Yeah, yeah it can be. Yeah. I mean, that's like that six point you killed. Yeah. I mean, there what? there were nothing special about it, but it I was like a big, a big six. six. We watched all year. Yeah. And once you got it on the ground, it's a good thing because he had he had something wrong with him, yeah. you know. Who knows? I still a big six out there. I one mention that scene last year. Oh, oh, there's, that's, and that's another thing is you know we got a lot of pictures of deer this year, but we ain't got we. I bet we ain't seen ten percent of the herd. I don't think you do. No, I mean because we really don't have them. You know we've got them on food sources, but like Mark was saying, I mean you you're only catching that deer a glimpse, like a doe. You know standing in front of there, and there's twenty deer in the field behind her that we don't see. So what is the what is the lapse time on these cameras as far as once it takes a picture, it has a delay before it'll take another one? Most of them, I don't know exactly where I have them set, but, I mean, you know, you can set them wherever you want. Most of the time I set, like, three bursts, 60 seconds or yeah. something like that. So how many times has a doe walked by that camera, set it off, and the buck's behind it, and you never, never see, see it? Never see it, yeah. yeah. It walks yeah. right if by you have it camera. on lapse yeah. like that. Yeah. Which chances are it might still be on your card if you have it on burst. Because it'll take, you know, like three pictures pretty quick, and then it'll wait 60 seconds before it'll take another trigger time. I think that's the way I have them set. But you could set however you wanted to, but that's one thing with the video is more of an advantage of it because that doe passed by and no buck comes by in that five seconds, and you still got them, yeah. you know. And I don't know how long is the maximum video time. The only thing bad, I mean, you need to run lithium batteries in those cameras. I've, the Energizer lithiums have performed better than any battery. That I've used. I mean, we've had them run mm -hmm. nine months. We hadn't had any of them yeah, bust, and yeah. the regular Duracell yeah. or regular battery Elite, will bust. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you got to get the the good memory cards, and I man, I, I think sixty fours or one twenty eights or something like that need to be because if you're gonna put it on video, it's gonna eat it's up your yeah. space. These little eight gig cards ain't or sixteen gigs ain't gonna cut it running video. They take a lot of pictures, but they won't take yeah. a lot of video. You'll fill them up. And I think it's a good thing to do some video, some stills. That way you kind of gauge what you got, you know. And who would ever thought deer hunting or hunting in general had as much technology, you know? Oh. <laughs> from That's just – we're barely touch, yeah, touching the tip of the iceberg with yeah, it, too. I Man, there's people who use all kinds of stuff. I mean, I like a lot of it. And I, 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 wish, I wish you could go back in time and say – like back in camp, like if we'd have had cell phone cameras when we were hunting Abbeville, it ain't no telling what we'd have saw. Oh, they'd been yeah. deer been at stink probably. Yeah, no, Billy Moore, Moore, if Billy Moore and Jimmy, Jimmy, if they'd have had cameras, it wouldn't be a deer <laughs> yeah. on hoof. Yeah, like, they'd, be, they'd be on a dangerous species list. But I don't know. It's it's crazy to think how much it's changed, and I mean, and we're like you say, we're not we're not tech savvy. We're not using all this. We're just trying to you know keep up the herd and get idea. Well, that's the other thing that it, it really helps you with. You know, the more you see your herd and the more you see your bucks on there, the more you kind of expect, you know, when I see that deer, I know what I'm looking at. And instead instead of, of like making you a know, mistake, you look down there and all of a sudden, oh, look at that deer. Bam. He's on the ground. Now That'll like, happen every now and then. Oh, yeah. That'll yeah. still happen. It depends on how nervous you get. If you use a scope to check the deer out, you're probably, killing it. You're probably killing it. Jamie told me that. I don't know where you got it from. There, there's there. the one that. Told me, like, you know, when you look through that scope, you're automatically in kill zone. Leave your gun sitting there and get your pair of binoculars, look through binoculars first, and yeah. then make your decision. I know what happened. See, I used to think I didn't need binoculars. Why would I take yeah. them? I got a scope with my rifle. I can see just give it it. Them crosshairs. Just, yeah. But that. When it, you hear one grunt and you don't see him, you hear it breaking limbs, and then you get the crosshairs on uh, him, it's game over. Yeah, yeah. Safety's <laughs> off. You ain't got a whole lot of time to look at him. That binoculars, at least you can look at him. And then, the man, then again, I have, have had binoculars. Like you're talking about, you see that deer and you're trying to look and it get by and not get the shot, but yeah. it's probably not honest to save some deer. It wasn't too. meant to yeah. be. It wasn't meant to be. If it's, if it's one that you for sure know, if you see him without binoculars and you know at that point it's, yeah. it's there, then it's there. But if you question it, I'm putting it down. Like last year, that one I seen, it was one of them deals. Like I looked at him, I was like, that's a good deer. Man, I don't know. And as soon as I said I don't know, I just set the gun down. Just I, I don't know. That's it. Don't don't question it. You know. See, so like with Darren at the island, you get two bucks. You got standards to go by. You can't afford to 
throw the gun up and shoot and one and done for the year. You know, you got you got to make now sure. Now, that old pot belly nanny do, it ain't no questions then. That's we, true, We're going to drop them. We're going to do that again this year? What's that? The dollar pound contest? Uh, we may. I don't think we're going to kill as many does this year. We don't – I don't. Well, it just depends on we get out there and we start seeing them. I mean, as far as what it looks like, it's almost like we got the numbers right now. Looks way closer than it ever has before. Yeah. You're seeing just as many bucks as we are does, and all the does got two fawns, which I really like. So I hate to, you know, I'd almost rather kill those yearling does than I had the thought the healthy does going to throw out twins every year. I've been, I've been watching between me and Mark, it's usually six every day. And one of them got a set of twins. They, them things still got spots. They're teeny. Oh, they're, they're so little. Really? Really? They were yeah. late drops. How, how long have how long they been? Y'all been seeing them? Oh, shoot. About couple, May. Yeah, a couple months. They still ain't grown. I mean, they must spots be, on them. Still got yeah. spots on them. Well, there's one other camera that was still nursing the <clears> day on camera. I did see that. Yeah. You can tell the difference in the does and the fawns when they drop early, drop late. Because, I mean, we've got some that have already lost all spots. And, you know, they're they're still with their moms. But they're, you know, they could probably make it on their own right now. But then we've got some that are still not trying to nurse. So, it don't I don't know. That as, might be an indicator they didn't get bred in time. Like, yeah. you know, there's too many does. If, if you see that, I don't know. It don't look as good and manicured between me and Mark now. It's kind of rough looking, but it's man, it's, deer. we've been seeing. I'm talking about it's, and it's the same one, but it's usually six to eight deer pretty much every morning, every afternoon. They're not scared of y'all, huh? They're still, they're still, yeah, a, there's yeah, a stud like I was, I was there. out at the grill the other night and I had my binoculars watching them. I kept one of the big, one of the big does with the yearlings kept looking back towards Mark. And I, Mark's dog Gus was in the backyard, and that's what. I mean, she wasn't spooked. She was still standing there eating, but she was paying oh, attention. Oh, he hates them. Really? He hates it. <clears throat> he can't stand it. But you been cooking anything good? You know, last weekend I didn't do too much. It was, well, it was football weekend, so I watched a lot of football and we cooked I cooked some chicken and didn't do didn't do any good recipes or anything like that. Nothing fancy. I just uh I know cooked some good eating food, cooked some burgers and cooked some chicken breast. Man, me and Mark have been so our buddy Frankie opened that Primo's butcher shop here in Hernando and we've been We've been wearing him out. I think, I think it's two hundred dollars worth of stuff I walked out with the other day. But man, he's I've been cooking up some stuff from him. So that's another thing. I got him on reserve for some fat too. Oh, just to keep us in enough. mind. Yeah, I'll definitely take some of that to grind. Oh, Which, uh, what's the best thing you've been getting? Those pork loins, man. And pork chops hard to beat. Blaze been Blaze been real good, but them bone in pork chops he's got are they're they're pretty dang good. I bought the quail breasts of the day. They were they were excellent. I started didn't touch them, didn't season them. They were already marinated, just whatever the little marinated so quail breast. It's a quail breast. How, how, yeah. how does it come? Is it already, is it on the bone or off the no, bone? No, it's off bone. Uh, Filet, uh, breasted out, wrapped in bacon. It's already probably, marinated? Probably six of them in a package, I think. Yeah. Five or six of them in a package. They're already in a little marinade, got bacon on them. Bacon's already wrapped. I just threw them on the grill. That's and too them. easy right there. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't nothing wrong Are with they it. About the size of like a bopper, a skinless. Looks like a teal breast. Oh, is that I small? I mean, it's yeah. you it's know, it's, small. Yeah, it ain't big at all. But it's one good. person, you know, it's one. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could eat a couple of them. I mean, it, it wasn't nothing, nothing to it. We cooked. I cooked deer all weekend because I was like, we got to reset the freezer, you know. So Friday, I cooked four back straps, and they were heck yeah, delicious. They were good. And then Saturday, did fry any of them? Or? Didn't fry any of them. I can't eat no fat yet. Oh. I'm still on the the pancreatic diet right now, <laughs> but uh. Grilled two whole, or excuse me, one whole, or two whole, excuse me, grilled two whole, and then cut the rest of them up, tenderized them, and kind of just done a little light marinade and grilled them off, charred them, just simple. But it was it was good eating. And then I done a, took two roasts out Saturday, thawed them, put them in my aluminum pot, let them cook all day, and dumped a bag of uh, wild rice off in there and kind of had like a dirty rice type little deal. But it was it was all real good. I did do a pit beef on on my other YouTube channel. It was kind of a take on Baltimore pit beef. I call it Mississippi pit beef. But that doing uh, the roast out of the hind quarter would be excellent that style. Well, you got you that just, slicer out there, that deli slicer. We're gonna put it. I forgot in that video. I, I sliced it with a knife. I wish I'd have had my deli slicer. I wish I'd have had that. I didn't even know we had one out there. But it's a meet your maker one, right? Yeah. We're gonna we got to do that recipe for a butt junkies recipe. Because all you do is sear the outside of just all sides. I mean, you're taking it to like 120 rare internal, and then you put it on a deli slicer and slice that dude thin. It makes just the best 
better than like roast beef you get at the store grocery store. You I mean, do, man, if you can do that, like a make it like a Philly cheese, you could save money. That'd be so good. You definitely could. Take it. Throw I, it I wonder now top. if you could slice it. If you get it about half froze, not froze all the way, I went ahead and run it on that slicer, and then turned it into Philly Philly steak meat. That might be a old video yeah, you yeah. need to try out there, Jamie. Like I've been writing some recipes down. I want to do a do some deer meat bologna this year. I've seen I've seen the I've been kits for it. it. I've never tried it. Can't be bad. The summer no. turned out. We got to be able to make bologna. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I'm ready to try with our new with our stuffer and stuff. Look up a few recipes. We can try up on that. I know we never didn't make those little links that we no. got out there. You know, we try our hand at that. And where are we at on our walk in? Uh, didn't it get shipped? I I saw a notification that it was shipping. I hadn't seen. I hadn't tracked it lately to see, but it's uh, it's well, it should be here this week if it's what, shipped. What kind was it? Do you remember the name of it? I mean, we got it from like restaurant equipment store online or Webster on. Webster. I know what it's called. Yeah, Webster. And it's a top it mount, a uh, top unit chiller top unit outdoor walk in yeah. cooler, eight by seven. Uh, by seven, seven foot seven tall, and it's eight by eight. Eight by eight. Okay. I'll be big enough to hold some deer if we can oh, rig yeah. us up some racks in it. That's going to be the next thing. What are we going to use? The gas pipe, probably. Gas, gas pipe. <clears throat> galvanized gas pipe. Rig it up to where we can hang them and take them. I don't know if we need a car. Or we just got to wheelbarrow them over there and hang them up or I what? I, 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 was, I was really hoping, well, I was wishing this would have been a thought when we built the yeah. shop, you know, where we could have put a door on the back of the shop. I'll I, I tell you one thing I have seen is you can get those gambrels that hook into your receiver hitch. You can put it on side by yeah. side. And you could back up to the skinning rack and then swap it over to that. You know, just let the hook get it and then slowly drive it out there and back it up to the other gas pipe. We'll figure we'll something out how to transport out. them because you definitely don't want to get no dirt or grime or nothing on them. Yeah, dropping them, have to wash them and all that. Yeah, because you're really not supposed to get them wet after you clean them and all that. That's about getting the moisture off of them, keeping yeah. them in that cooled environment. That's what you're wanting to happen. It's kind of dry aging it, right? Yeah. To so see, who's to say? I mean, we could even just quarter them, you know, and just lay them on a rack. You could, there, yeah. You I've know. seen, I've seen them do that. Like it's all quartered on a wire rack inside yeah. of walk in. As long as you can get airflow around all of it, that's not laying on something flow. flat. Yeah. Now I did them back straps. I cooked Friday. I took them out. Had them thawed on Wednesday. I took them out and I put them on a rack and threw them in my fridge in the garage and let them dry out like two days. Just enough, man. It's so much easier to clean. Does them it up. make a difference? I've done it up to a week at the house, like just put them in a the fridge that you don't use and they'll turn dark. And yeah, I mean, it, it breaks them down and yeah. it's the easiest thing or what I like is it makes it 10 times easier removing that silver skin. Cause like, I don't like on my back straps, I don't t- trim them a lot before I vacuum seal it because that way, if something does get a little freezer burn or something does yeah, go wrong, shield on it. yeah, you can cut that off and <clears> still got good meat under it. Right. So I, this still had the silver skin on the back strap and letting it dry just a little bit. Man, you can run a fillet knife under and it peels right off so much easier. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. That's why, you know, that a lot of, we didn't, we've talked about that before too. You know, we, leaving that silver skin on when I used to take the whole hind quarters and debone those, I never would take all that silver skin off anyways, just, you know, as a, another layer of protection. Cause usually if you cut them up, I hate cutting them up and putting them in a the freezer because they, they always freezer burn. Unless you vacuum seal them, and then, you know, even then you poke a hole in them or something, it's over with. Yeah. But, you know, leaving that silver skin on a lot of it, you know, when you put it up, kind of helps you whenever you get, take it back out and not waste so much. Man, you done a good job pissing the cairns off with the back strap, though. Ooh, did I what I do? I guess because it had fillet in it. They got all tore up because it was a back strap. It's just not a fillet. Oh, okay. You know, just keyboard, You're keyboard wearing- cooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's backstrap. Yeah. Backstrap and filet. Deer meat. Yeah. Just call it deer meat. That pisses yeah. them off. I still too. want to do the old school. My daddy used to do it, which you cut the ribs off and <clears throat> meat saw and cut it up like a T bone back with the like a little tomahawk. <clears throat> yep. Line of work. Me and Mike had done it one time. I did it one time. It was Which we didn't know what we were doing. We had DeWalt Salzo out there and <laughs> we didn't yeah, I was working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Jamie yeah. probably wanted to go do cabinets next week, got blood all over with everything he had. <laughs> I've had them. I've had them like process like that. I've never tried to do it myself. It's, it's just how we do it with not not gutting a deer. You do got to gut the deer to do all that. Yeah, but yeah. Just how but we we're gonna have to do that anyway this year. If we're gonna <laughs> hang, them. Right. We're gonna hang yeah. them. You gotta yep. get it all out. There won't be nothing to it though. 
Yeah, if you if we had you know if we got the meat saw and those tables where you can you know break it down kind of like they do on the those butchers do you can lay it on a table and then you know run it down it run it down it that's not probably wouldn't be too bad. The dad and him always dressed it out, gutted it, whatever, and then it hatchet got now he had a meat a hand meat saw and he cut the ribs off on both sides, cut the cut the backbone off at the shoulder, and then cut it off at the hind quarter and then laid the whole back strap. And just cut it in between the bones and done like basically like it's a little T bone steak yeah, yeah. back strap on there. Would he leave the inner loin in there to yeah. get the on the back ribs to get the We could do that. Else? We could do some uh T bones. That'd be pretty good. That's I tell you that inside tenderloin is the best. That's, that's the best. what they were saying. That's the whole deal with that. Everybody's like the fillets the inside tenderloin. That tenderloin don't make it to nightfall if I kill it. Oh, yeah. It's getting cooked right then and there. You, and you don't you don't get a big enough one of those to turn into steaks. Yeah. I mean, if you cook it, cook it whole or either cut it up and fry it. That's the best way. Cut it up and fry it with yeah. biscuits and gravy. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's the best it. way. That's what we need to do is the old school deer camp tradition where we used to hand cut the potatoes and fry them. Daddy'd marinate the old Italian dressing deer meat that's done been tenderized. Four or yeah. five times. It's like minute steak. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll cook on the grill in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll, he'd fry them up in that big skillet and have biscuits and gravy. And then what do you like? Fries. Bread them or just, yeah. yeah. Man, Man, that used to be some fine eating. That and he'd always do Friday night uh, barbecue deer meat in the crock pot. It was good. Yeah. I think he boiled it first in a water. He didn't that. He would just throw it, he would Bring rinse it real good. He'd salt, he'd put it in salt water, I think, but then he would just put it in the crock pot and let it go. And then pour a bottle of <coughs> poor bottle cheap barbecue sweet sauce. Baby Ray's Ray's some sweet baby Ray's. Yeah. Shred it up with forks or something. Yeah. I've had it like Back then at Deer Camp, by then, everybody was drunk anyway. It didn't matter what it, you thought it was good. It's <laughs> <laughs> the nostalgia of it. Yeah. Good well, stuff. That's pretty much got us for today, guys. We'll uh, come back next week and do it again. Do it Hopefully we'll have some more to report. We're just going to move some cameras around and. See if we can see what other kind of bucks we got creeping around here. But check it out. Mark. Uh, Man, y'all check us out on all the platforms. We we try to keep the content going, get y'all some videos, some podcasts, and try to just take y'all along with our hunting season and how our year's going. And if y'all got any questions, let us know, and we'll be glad to answer them. Y'all check us out at buckjunkies.com. And, hey, y'all, if y'all are in the area, come to Malcolm's shop. We got some cameras. Mikey, what we get yesterday? Yeah, I, seen, I seen a new yeah, product. We got, some, uh, we got some stands yesterday. Sure did. So, it's condos, wasn't it? Yeah, sports and got condos. Some sports we got and two condos. kinds of those yesterday, and those should be – we should have those priced out and sitting out front within by the end of the week, I hope. So, if you Man. close to North Mississippi, come see us. Uh, sports and condos, they're not the Cadillac. You're not spending $3,000. Bang for the buck. Hard they're the do, Ford man. freaking Ranger of deer stands. What they are. <laughs> you they are Ford you Ranger. Beat they're pretty nice to me. Yeah, I mean – I like them. Heck I do yeah. too. But the money, you ain't going to beat it. I'm with you on that. And they, and they last. I mean, ain't nothing on them to tear up, really. Well. They ain't going to rot. But, uh, we appreciate it, and thank you all for listening, and y'all come check us out. We gone. See you.